Well, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we're wrapping up the Ten Commandments today, and it is the Ninth and the Tenth Commandments. These are the commandments that, that deal with coveting, right? The Ninth Commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. And the Tenth Commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And at first glance, you might look at these and say, oh man, these are a little old-fashioned, right? I haven't been coveting anybody's ox recently, so I must be okay. But as you look at them a little bit deeper, at least as I looked at these a little bit deeper and, and read some of the scriptures surrounding these, the, the one thought that came to my mind was, hmm, haven't we already covered these? Right? You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Right? Isn't there already a commandment that deals with this? Right? The sixth commandment. Right? You shall not commit adultery. Right? Remember what that one, and remember what Jesus said about the sixth commandment? If you've even looked at somebody with lust in your heart, basically coveting them, you've committed adultery. Okay, so that one should be covered. Check the Sixth Commandment. Follow the Sixth Commandment. We've got this one covered. And then the Seventh Commandment. Do you remember that, what that one was? You shall not steal. And doesn't that deal with our neighbor's house, right? It wasn't just about stealing like shoplifting, but we had talked about the Seventh Commandment. We're actually working to preserve our neighbor's property and not taking from them, but adding to their things, basically, and blessing them. So doesn't that, that kind of, if we're actually trying to help everybody preserve their property, then we're not coveting it. So we really don't need Commandment 9 and 10. At least that's what I first thought as I looked at it. But then you start thinking about these a little bit more. And I'm not God, so I don't know why he gives us these Ten Commandments, but he does. And I think one of the reasons why 9 and 10 are there, and they're not just included in the other commandments that we've already covered, is for those times when we really want to be sneaky in our sin. Right? And we all have those times when we want to make it look like we're uprighteous, Right, where we're doing the honorable thing, but we're actually, by that pious action, covering up some selfish motives and covering up some sin. Right? Martin Luther, in the large catechism, he puts it like this, and I, and I love this. I, I, I imagine there's a little humor in his voice as he writes these words. He says, This last commandment, therefore, is given not for the cheaters in the eyes of the world, it is for the most pious who want to be praised and be called honest and upright people. Right? This isn't for those people that are just outright out there committing adultery, right? That are just, just the cheaters, the ones that are outright there blatantly sinning. Right? This is for those of us who are pious, who want to be seen as righteous and upstanding people. Right? It's for those of us who are kind of sneaky in our sin, who are kind of like those sneaky snakes. And we all like to do this, right? When this commandment was given to God's people, it was common in the Old Testament for people to get a divorce. And it was really easy for you to give your wife a certificate of divorce. You basically said you wanted it, you got a certificate of divorce, you could give it to your wife, and boom, you were kind of divorced, right? Talked about not doing that. We talked about kind of the sixth commandment, not doing that. But also, what would have been really easy and would have been really common for people to do is say, maybe you were coveting your neighbor's wife and saying, man, I wish she could be my wife. Now, if you wanted to act on that sin or that temptation, you could do one or two things. You could go have an affair, right? And that's breaking the sixth commandment. So you probably shouldn't do that. And if you knew the commandments, you, you, you probably wouldn't do that. Maybe not. But then you say to yourself, you know what? I could be a little sneaky about it. Right? Why don't I take my friend who's her husband, why don't we go out for lunch? And then maybe I can get him talking about how bad his wife is. Maybe just bring up a few things. Man, how's your wife doing? And get him to just kind of badmouth her a little bit. And then I can help him realize how miserable actually he is in his marriage. And then I can say, you know what? 
why don't you just go ahead and divorce your wife? Right? This is overly simplified, by the way. Sure enough, he gives her a certificate of divorce, right? And then what can you do as an upstanding, uprighteous citizen? You can sweep right in and claim her as a wife of your own, and you are the Savior, right? You're the one who's uprighteous. When in reality, you've been a sneaky snake. Right? You, you've gone in there and caused your friend to divorce his wife so that you can sleep in there because you coveted her. Don't be a sneaky snake. And that's the temptation in all of our sin. All the way back in Genesis 3. That's where we get sneaky snakes from, right? Genesis 3. Most of us know the story. Everything's perfect. Adam and Eve are living in the Garden of Eden. And then the sneaky snake comes. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Right? He's more crafty than anybody else. He's sneaky and God's given Eve all of these things and the serpent goes up to Eve and say, You know what? Did God say you, you couldn't actually eat of any tree of the garden? Right? What about that one over there in the center? Right, don't, don't you want that? Right? If you eat of that, you, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Right? You, you'll have even more. It'll be even better. And he gets her to covet by being crafty, by being sneaky. Right? The grass is greener over there. So, so Eve, why, why don't you just go for it? Right? It'll feel good. You, you know you want more. And in his sneakiness, he gets her to covet more than what God's already given her. He gets her to kind of doubt her security with being a daughter or a child of God. And that's the essence of all of our sin. Right? We, we love to be sneaky in our sin where it doesn't look like we're sinning. Right? It doesn't look like we're going against God's ways, but in reality, we're, we're kind of being a sneaky snake as we covet to try to get more. It happens in business all the time, I think. Maybe you, you, you see somebody else's employee, an employee that works for another company, you're like, man, I wish they would come work for me. So maybe you take them out to lunch and you get them to complain about their boss. You can, everybody can complain about people, right? We're all sinners. So you point out a couple of the faults in their boss and you get, them, you get them on their tirade about how miserable they are and how much they hate their current boss. Right? And then you make your pitch say, look how green the grass is over here. Come and work for me. Right? And you covet them. You try to lure them over at the expense of their current employer. Maybe you're a little sneaky about it. We do this in our families. Right? Maybe, maybe you're part of kind of a blended family and your, your stepson or your stepdaughter is over for the weekend. And man, they bring up something about your, your husband or your wife's ex, about how, how mad they're making them, and you just kind of fuel the fire. So when they go back to their mom or their dad, right, you've driven a little wedge there so that you could get them a little closer to you. That's coveting. That's being a little bit of a sneaky snake. That's destroying relationships that God has established. Right? Maybe for you, I, I see this unfortunately happen a lot around funerals. Right? Maybe for you, you, you lose a, a mom or a dad, your parent, and you decide to just be a little sneaky with the inheritance. Right? You, you deserve just a little bit more, and, and it just gets kind of messy. Right? And you're just coveting a little bit more, and then you end up destroying the relationships in your family because you've been sneaky. I see this happen too often, and it breaks my heart when I see that. All because we're coveting, all because we're being sneaky, all because we're wanting more. It destroys relationships. And this is what we see happening in our Gospel lesson. Right? The Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the, the leaders of, of God's people. Right? They, they're, they're coveting the power that Jesus has. They're not liking the influence that they have, so they decide to be sneaky snakes to try to get rid of Jesus. They arrest him in the middle of the night. Then we find out in Mark chapter 15. It says, as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation, right? 
that's a fancy way of saying they all kind of gathered together, right, with the elders and the scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate, the Roman official who had the power and the authority to put him to death, to get rid of him. And this is typically, right, like a Holy Week reading, right? And we know what happens, right? Pilate looks at Jesus and doesn't really say anything wrong with him. He says, hey, you know, they say you're the king of the Jews. Are you the king of the Jews? And how does Jesus answer? You've said so, right? He doesn't say much. He just said, you've said so. He, he knows he's probably going to the cross, Meanwhile, the chief priests and the leaders and the scribes, they're all conspiring to get rid of Jesus. They want Him gone out of envy, right? They want to get rid of Him. Pilate has the idea, he goes, well, he gets requested by the crowd actually, that he released one, one of the prisoners according to the custom for the festival that they were in. So Pilate thinks to himself, well, you know, I could give him Jesus, the King of the Jews, who you call the King of the Jews, or this guy... Barabbas. And remember who Barabbas was? He was a man of the insurrection, a murderer of the insurrection. We have a term for that today. That's like a domestic terrorist. So I'll give you this domestic terrorist, Barabbas, or the king of the Jews. And remember what the leaders do? The chief priests and the scribes? They stir up the crowd to have Pilate release for them Barabbas instead. All because Pilate saw out of their envy, out of their coveting. And Jesus ends up crucified. As we covet, as we envy, as we become these sneaky snakes, destruction happens. It ends up with Jesus up on the cross as we break relationships. Right, Paul talks about this in his letter. He writes a letter to Timothy, who's a young pastor. And that was our, our New Testament lesson. He says, But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Right? Godliness with contentment is great gain, but if you're desiring to have more, if you're being a sneaky snake to con connive and get more and more and more, it's going to end in ruin. There's not going to be much hope there. And it ends in the crucifixion of Jesus. But Paul here says there's a different way. Right? He says, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession. He says rather than fighting and trying to get more and more and more and being sneaky about things to take and take and take from other people, right? fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the faith that you've been given in Jesus where he's conquered death. Right where we have this promise that nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Take hold of that and know that that's going to be enough. That Jesus is going to get you through. And he says, remember, right? In the presence of Christ Jesus, who in the testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession. He's wanting you to remember back to Jesus before Pontius Pilate. Right, our gospel lesson. And what confession does Jesus make? Right, as Pilate asked him, "Are you the King of the Jews?" Jesus says, "It is, as you say. Right, you, you say it is basically. Right. Notice what Jesus doesn't do. Jesus doesn't covet to get more. He doesn't look up to the the angel armies up in heaven and say, "Come on down." Right. He doesn't call the angels down and say, "Haul me up in a chariot of fire." 
doesn't call upon his Father up in heaven to rain fire and brimstone down on all the Pharisees and the chief priests and the Romans. No, he simply is content. He simply trusts that his Father has a plan, that his Father is going to bring him through this to a resurrection. And he's pretty much quiet and says, basically, you say it is, and then he goes to the cross where his Father raises him from death to life. Here Paul says, take hold of that, knowing that Jesus has died for you and been raised for you, that he is enough, that he is going to carry you through, that there is forgiveness and grace there. Cling hold of him. He's the one that's going to get you through. Don't covet more and more and more. There's no hope there. But cling to Jesus, right? Knowing that he will carry you through knowing that there's forgiveness there as for the times that you covet. You know, essentially, that's the point of the Ten Commandments. <laughs> the Ten Commandments should lead us back to our Savior, Jesus. Hopefully, one of the things that you've learned over the last, I don't know, six weeks where we've been looking at the Ten Commandments is that out of every single one of them, we don't live up to the standard. We fail them. We fail at it. We fail to meet the standard. But we see Jesus completely meets the standard for you and me. All the way to the point of death on a cross where he has been raised up, right? The standard is love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus does that completely. He completely trusts the will of his Father and he completely loves you more than he loves himself, I might say, as he dies for you and rises for you. So take hold of him. Right? Let his love flow through you as we strive to meet the standard. Right? Don't just disregard it, but strive to meet it. But let his love and grace flow through you as you live your life that your neighbor, too, might see those blessings as well in Jesus. Amen. May the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. At this time, we'll take a few.